to be here with us today. Um, met with her a couple of times and the work that she's doing is absolutely phenomenal. Um, but a little bit about Betsy, she is the founder and executive director of Melodic Connections. She believes that nothing equals the power of music to ignite relationships and move communities to action. Betsy has worked in the field of music and music therapy in Cincinnati for 20 years. In 2008, she began to build what is now the largest team of trauma-informed care certified music therapists, music educators, and musicians in Cincinnati healing the city through connection and resilience. The work of Betsy and her team is rooted in the study of the intersections of music performance, music therapy, trauma responsive care, and asset-based community development. Betsy received her BM in music therapy from the University of Iowa. She has an MM in oboe performance from CCM and her MED in, from UC in special education. She was honored to be named the CCM Distinguished Alumni of the Year in 2019 and a 2018 TEDx Cincinnati Women Extraordinary Women Honoree. Thank you, Betsy, for being here. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, that's the, uh, whenever I, when I hear that bio, it's quite one to live up to. So let's just put that aside and, uh, <laughs> and get down to the business of making music. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, 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 just typically, if we were in person, we would start immediately with some uh, music playing together, some grounding. Um, instead, I found this amazing um, video that I would like to begin with today. So here we are. We are part of everything, and everything is a part of us. We are human only through the humanity of others. I am because we are Ubuntu.
so I know that was a, a long intro of not me speaking, but it says more than my words could. Um, I just, when I watch that and I allow myself to be taken away by that music, I get, I, I'm emotionally moved every time um, but between the music and the harmonies and the, um, and the words, it's just amazing to me. So thank you um, for joining me on that uh, short journey there. Um, okay. So I'm gonna go now to this one. That's the wrong one. I got this. Okay. Can you see my, um, what can you see right now? You can see you up close. So I think, yes. okay. Go back to your. So somehow I just kept my YouTube going. Okay. Got it. There you go. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So here we go. I believe more than ever these days that music can save us. In The Body Keeps the Score, Bessel van der Kolk tells us that the wiring of our brain circuits is devoted to being in tune with others, in tune with others. Our ability to attach to each other and to attune to others is our greatest protection against the effects of trauma. In Together, Vivek Murthy describes Ubuntu as a connection to the group, harmony foremost. Harmony foremost. And Bruce Perry tells us that it's the process of repetitive rhythmic somatosensory movement that brings us to a place of regulation so that we can be in relationship and ultimately in dialogue with one another. So how do these brilliant doctors, psychiatrists known around the world and the former Surgeon General of the United States and from what I believe, the new leader of the COVID task force. Um, how, how, do these, uh, how do these brilliant people describe the human necessity to belong? They describe it with the words in tune, harmony, and rhythm. Why do they choose these words? That's what we're gonna explore today. It's no accident of happy nouns and adjectives. In fact, when considering music, there's no other stimulus or cognitive process that simultaneously engages almost every region of the brain from the prefrontal cortex to the amygdala. Musicians have known this instinctually for years and now we have the science to prove it. I wanna see what my next slide is. There we go, so Ubuntu. I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute because when I share, I can only see that and I feel the need to see everybody a little bit more. Okay, so I'll go back to that. So last, when I wrote this, it was last week. Now it's a, maybe a month or so ago. I was in line at Kroger getting the few things that I forgot on click list because going into a store is scary right now, right? And so I was anxious and I was tense. I was wondering why the lines were just so long and why the person behind me was standing so close. I mean, there's the dots on the floor. Why can't they just stand a little bit farther away? What I saw in the, I was looking and scanning the magazines for a distraction and I saw this and I just had to buy it even though I know most of the stuff in it and I'm sure you've all seen it. Oprah's latest, The Power of Connection. <laughs> Overcoming loneliness, building community, finding joy in every day. And I thought to myself, what? Okay, so our society has become so disconnected that there's not only self-help books and podcasts all about how to build more community. I mean, Brene's got two now, right? Um, and, and we all love Dax, but a, uh, a quick read on the magazine rack next to the Halloween, then Halloween, now it's, um, I saw it this morning at Whole Foods on my way in too. So next to the Thanksgiving stuff, a quick read uh, next to all the fall pot pie recipes and everything else, this addition to our pop culture. 
Um, it's got to be like a quick read. I'll show if we can overcome loneliness in, you know, <laughs> just uh, 30 easy pages. That's all it takes, says Oprah. Um, but to me, what this does is solidify loneliness and disconnection as an epidemic. And that's why I bought it because I thought this is a moment and I've got, I've got to, I want to have this piece in my in my collection of stuff that says like okay we are all so lonely and feeling so disconnected that there's even something that I can pick up to try to solve it on my way out of the grocery store or on my way out of Target which I was scared to go into anyway because I, I'm, I'm afraid that the mask is not just you know enough right all right so you and I, though, as practitioners and all the other researchers like John Cacioppo know that it's not as easy as reading a magazine because loneliness, and this was interesting, it was brought up even during, um, during our lunch uh, session with Mary. And those of you who have had uh, trainings with Mary are gonna hear all kinds of uh, Maryisms all the way through this. Uh, I bet if you, um, I bet if you did a grounded theory of my of my work today, it would be over 50% Mary information. So thank you, Mary. <laughs> so loneliness creates hypervigilance though, right? Because we're wired for connection. Loneliness puts us in a state of chronic stress. If we're lonely, the research tells us that it's highly likely that we're also depressed and we're also anxious. So how can we start connecting with people and reaching out to other people if we're starting below ground zero in a state of depression, anxiety, and hypervigilance, right? So if you're lucky enough to be a musician like me, sometimes I just go home at night, um, especially early on in April, um, in March and April, a little bit of May, and I just sit at my piano sometimes because words were too much. And I would play and I would sing. And sometimes I would just cry. And sometimes I would sing at the top of my lungs like every word meant my life. Um, and uh, I have two little boys, a four-year-old and a six-year-old. And a lot of times when I'm playing at the piano, they join me. It's uh, We've got a dining room that's not a dining room. It's got a piano in it and all of their toys and their train table and everything else. Um, so a lot of times, um, Ollie, my little one, my four-year-old, if I'm playing the piano, he'll start moving his train around the table while I'm playing um, around and around the track. Um, Henry plays piano. We've got a little mini drum set for him. He's six. Sometimes he'll sit at the drum set or he'll stand at the piano and play with me a little bit. But you know what, whatever they're doing, it doesn't really matter. Um, they're in the room with me. And what's important is that together we're co-creating this rhythmic and melodic experience. And we don't have to have words during this time. We're not talking to each other. I'm not asking them how they feel. Um, but our mirror neurons are starting to fire like crazy because we are doing together, we're seeing together and we're hearing together each other's actions. So like I said at four and six, my boys can't always tell me what they need for emotional support and I think that we're all here today because uh, I am one of many who at, uh, well I'm 43, you all are various ages, but I can't always tell you what I need for emotional support. <laughs> so but, but when we're making music together at my house, um, at our house, um, we start to become attuned to each other. And I start seeing things from their point of view. And because of all those mirror neurons that are firing, I start to anticipate their next move. So the next time that they pick up that little Thomas train and they throw it at me, instead of just the anger, I can start to see the fear behind their anger. Because knowing and being known and being in tune with each other that's what's gonna help us move forward then together in relationship. And that's why I think those words that we began the day with that Vivek uses in his book together are so powerful. I am 
because you are. You are because we are. So come along with me now. We're gonna spend the next um, 70 minutes or so um, breaking down exactly why I believe music is what will save us. I'm going to maintain an attitude of hope and possibility, but know that the, uh, the gravity of the days in which we're living, they're not lost on me. And I'm asking you along with me for the next moments together to suspend your fear and your frustration and lean into some possibilities for how we can build resilience through shared music making. So I'm gonna begin by showing you a video that was created about this thing that we're gonna dig into called Common Time. It was so much fun. Um, people started singing harmonies and remembering songs they haven't done maybe in a while. And the musicianship that evening was just wonderful. There were crescendos and decrescendos and um, all these moments of becoming the song. I'm Ellen Beyer and my son is uh, Tristan Beyer. Um, we live in this community during the part where people break off and sort of separate into small groups. Uh, Tristan went off with two people he did not know. Now for Tristan, that's a big deal. And yet I looked over from the group I was in and I saw this big smile on his face. He was so happy to be included and accepted by these two people from the community that he didn't know and who didn't know him previously. I brought a friend of mine who has dementia and she, as a result she's very isolated when she left. She couldn't wait for the next one. For a little while she wasn't isolated and she was, uh, she just felt so included. Those are the kinds of experiences that people have during common time that when they leave they take that, that with them, that, that they're important. It's so simple, it's so portable, it's so timeless, almost like coming around a campfire, coming together. I would challenge everyone to ask themselves, where could they see this program in their communities and how could they see it affecting positive change, healing, bridging divides within their communities? We live in a world of infinite choices. Choosing one thing is the revolutionary act. Let's start playing in a new way.
So I'm back, right? Yes, okay, thanks. Um, common time events uh, when they're held at our studio are um, about 90 minutes in length. The first 10 minutes allows for everybody to, and they happen in like a big warehouse space. Um, the first uh, 10 minutes allow for everyone to enter the space and begin to feel safe. The event, oh, hang on, I think I hear my, I'm losing. I feel like, there we go. Okay. Okay, maybe it was somebody else. Um, so the first 10 minutes allow for everybody to enter the space and begin to feel safe. The event begins, though, the moment that participants enter the room with name tags, fellowship, hospitality, space is welcoming, and the environment is very carefully prepared. Um, facilitators during this time, and we usually had about two to four facilitators. Um, three of us were musicians, and one uh, helped assist with the um, actual facilitation of the uh, group itself. Um, and uh, we all, and typically we had between 40 and 70 people show up. We held them once a month, um, pre-COVID. Um, facilitators during this time ensure that everyone entering the space has a name tag, has been shown the seating area, knows where the restrooms are, all of that. It's a time for welcoming and uh, for felt safety, building felt safety in the room. Okay, so now I'd like to try just a very abbreviated moment of virtual connection through common time with you. Um, so following the first 10 minutes comes a moment of setting the framework for the event. So I'm going to walk you through that and then we're just going to do a little bit of um, a very short music singing thing. Okay, um, so let's begin. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here in this space. For the next five minutes or so, we will be experiencing something that no one else will experience ever again because live music is like that. It happens in a specific time and place, once. To make it happen, we're going to start to listen to each other in new ways and tell a story that's uniquely ours. So notice a few things. Everyone here on this uh, Zoom call today is a part of this circle. Take a moment to look around you at the people on this, uh, on the screen, on your screen. If you're here today, you are now a musician. And as musicians, we use our eyes and our ears to communicate. Every single person here today has an instrument. So typically every chair in the room has an instrument on it, a guitar, a, a keyboard, um, maybe some egg shakers, a drum, so you can, whatever your comfort level, um, even just some rhythm sticks, but you can go all the way from a guitar to a couple of egg shakers. Um, but let's just for a moment suspend reality and say everybody here today has an instrument. It might be your voice and you do. It might be your voice, it might be your hands, or it might be your feet. You might have a pencil next to you that you could tap. Um, so uh, use that thing that you have with you. Don't be afraid of the sound. Everyone's here to make a contribution. We'll stay on mute, okay? Because um, there's too much delay with the music. Not that I don't want to hear everyone's sounds. Uh, but everyone here is here to make a contribution. We want to hear your voice. So we want you to hear your voice resonating in your room. So get bold, experiment, try a new rhythm, a new sound maybe. Some are going to be amazing. Some aren't going to be amazing. So some you'll repeat and some you won't. As you clap, tap, and sing along as uh, we go and move through the song, think about one to three words that describe your experience and maybe type them into the chat if you're so inclined at the end. All right, so I'm gonna sing and play and just offer some grace because there's always delay. I've tried this a few different, a couple different ways. I've tried playing the music through it and singing along. There's too much delay. There's gonna be some delay. Just offer up a little grace, have some fun and uh, sing along with me. We're gonna do three little birds, okay? So. Don't worry, I'm sure you have the new words about a thing. I'll do it maybe two times. 
gives you a little bit of the idea of what happens um, as a team at Melodic Connection. Oh, you might want to type into the chat. I forgot to ask you if you have a word or two that kind of meant something there, that break um, in the action, the break of listening. Maybe you made eye contact with somebody in the screen, um, through the screen. Um, maybe you saw somebody clapping, so you decided to clap. Um, kind of just a word or two about how it felt. Um, it, it's, it's tricky stuff to do virtually, admittedly, but um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor. Um, so as a team at Melodic Connections, we uh, usually do about a 90 minute common time. We've done them at schools for parents, teachers, and children. We've done them with corporations. Um, we did it once with the uh, fifth third technology team, they were trying to gather and try to get their tech team to start thinking in new ways. So we did this as a lead into their offsite for the day. Um, and we used to host monthly gatherings at our studio uh, where there were 30 to 40 people who would simply just show up on a Tuesday night to make music. And um, we, have, we, we would invite a community musician to lead it with us. We had uh, people from, uh, you saw Joni Whitaker on the, um, on the video to, uh, we had a small group from the symphony. And one day we were even lucky enough to have Clyde Davis, um, who was out of the, uh, the Philly uh, kind of version of the Motown scene. It was an amazing night where we improv some Heard It Through the Grapevine and I mean, just sparks were flying in the air. It was unbelievable, um, as, as was the symphony one too. Um, those were just crazy nights of everybody in the room making music all together. People start to, um, there's an energy that shifts. Uh, it's, it's palpable. Um, so people would show up and these groups of people, uh, when they just show up to our studio, completely diverse group of people, both neurocognitively and as uh, racially diverse as we could, um, assemble um, really diverse groups of people. No one in the room knew everyone. But by the end, there is this felt sense of connection and this felt sense of community. Um, and we, we had surveys that we would collect where we would ask people at the beginning how they felt um, about, uh, how connected they felt to the people in the room and on a uh, Likert scale. And then we would ask them to answer the same question again it was a five point Likert scale and they would move on the average, um, we did this for two years, on the average they would move uh, at least two steps on a five point scale towards um, felt community. Um, so people would tell us through their surveys that they collected and they would tell us also though, perhaps more importantly, through their smiles and their laughter and their desire to linger and talk after these events um, and through them, showing up at future sessions. I mean, it, it worked every single time it worked. 
Um, and I want to show you now another example, not in our studio, of how it worked um, and how it works, how it will work again. Okay, there we go. Inside School is using the arts to better connect with students and parents. And the best part about this, they say it's working. And it's so cool. I love this program. With the help of local musicians and certified therapists, communication is happening through music. Here's Brad Underwood. As the instruments get ready for the children, they start to file in. Just write down one word that describes your day so far. Not all the words are good. Some kids are mad, tired, frustrated. But as they pick up an instrument, those troubles start to fade away. It feels good, like I can feel my own soul going through the waves of the music. Ready, be good. All right, take it down. It happens once a month at Roll Hill School. Melodic Connections, a nonprofit music therapy group, plays lead and keeps the beat. You find a red and you play a red. That's it, man. Colors help separate notes and chords. Ooh. Keep on knocking, but you can't come in. Come back tomorrow night and try it again. Music gets them in the room, but the lesson is changing their lives. I was mad. I do not got proud of myself because I really tried. At first, I was not in mood, like I was mad. But when we got to when we got to play the instruments and stuff, I kind of I was feeling it, and then I started being happy and excited. That's what music does. It makes us smile. It makes us feel something. It's something that they can create. It's something that's their own, and they're not wrong. And that's the point. This circle gives the kids a space they didn't have before. It's pretty awesome and amazing to see uh, students' confidence just blossom and grow in this circle. Uh, we've had a few returning parents and students that say that their relationships have grown from being a part of this circle. And the hope is more kids join the circle. I think it will make them happy, proud of themselves, and excited. Brad Underwood, Local 12 News. Wow, I never had enthusiastic teachers like that, did you? Anyway, this is... There we go. I'm not sharing anymore, right? Nope. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so maybe a little too enthusiastic. I get a little excited sometimes. Um, that Roll Hill was a, uh, the, the work we did at Roll Hill where we took common time from our studio out there was probably some of the work I've been most proud of in the past couple of years. Um, they came to us asking, um, the uh, community resource coordinator came to me saying like, is there something that you could provide that would help connect parents, teachers, and students in a new way? And I said, let's try this common time. So we offered it up after school, kids, um, kids came. I, uh, we, we actually spent about a, uh, a good half a year just hanging out in the school during some of their um, building relationship. Um, like we, we just went to um, their Halloween night and like ate, sat and ate dinner with them and talked to some people. And so it wasn't just like, oh, we're just, we, we, we made every attempt to first as much as possible become a little bit of a part of the community. And then I met with the student council and I said, hey students, would you, you know, will you help me um, pass out, get the word out about this? And so they did. And any child who wanted to could show up to this program after school. The only caveat was they had to bring a parent with them. So um, they had, we had parents and children. I have amazing pictures of a little girl sitting on her mommy's lap playing um, the keyboard together. Um, a mom and a teenager looking at each other, playing guitar together. I mean, unbelievable moments that when you know the backstory of that mom and that teenage boy, the mom had come in saying, my goal to the teacher, she said, my goal for the year is to make a connection with my child because 
we're starting to grow apart and I see him, you know, leaving the family and going and connecting with more people in the neighborhood. And I want to be that connection for my child. And like, these were ways that they did that um, because the way we set up music, you can see it's not about the product. <laughs> it's never about the product for me. Um, uh, it's not about the product. It's about the process of making music together and co-regulation. So that's what we're going to get into here. Um, we're going to dig into why this works. Um, we're going to look at three things today of why it works. Um, this one, thank you, Mary. Music uh, creates an environment of felt safety, attachment, and regulation. I'm going to show you a little bit about why that is. Um, this is research I found. It's called the shared effective motion experience, the shared effective motion experience, the same model promotes a sense of agency and social drive that happens in active music making sessions. And then we're gonna take a look at how group music making can support um, the protective factors as taught to, um, as taught to me and my team by uh, Mary's team, agency, self-esteem, external supports, affiliation, and safe, stable, nurturing relationships. Um, and, if you hang with me at the end, I'm going to show you a few things that I've used um, that, that I think you can use um, in a non-music therapy context, but clinically, I, I believe that you should be able to use some of these things um, to help co-regulate co with your clients virtually. I've got a couple of virtual things that um, I have picked up within this season, and um, I have seen others use and I've taught them to some college students in a program at UC I'm helping teach. So, um, so hang in there and I promise I'm gonna give you a few practical things at the end. Hang in, hang in for the nerdy stuff and I'll give you some practical stuff at the end, okay? All right, so felt safety attachment regulation. All right, Vanderkolk tells us that having a good support network constitutes the single most powerful protection against becoming traumatized. Okay, we know that. We know that safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. Um, and, and we know that that is part of why we've got books like this out there, right? Okay, which are serving a need, absolutely. Um, Vander Kolk also reminds us that the critical issue here though is reciprocity. So being heard and seen by people around us, feeling that we are held in someone else's mind and heart. This is the essence of empathy and attunement. Now, over in my world, there's a music psychologist, Frederick Seddon, who describes this literally as empathetic attunement. <laughs> and he says, it's exactly what happens when we make music together. In fact, as I said before, there's no other stimulus or cognitive process, none, that simultaneously engages almost every region of the brain from the prefrontal cortex into the amygdala. Okay, so for this part, I'm gonna to go to Siegel's handbrain model. I know that most of you know this. I'm gonna just show you how music fits into this puzzle piece, okay? Um, again, this, this is all, thank you, Mary. Handbrain, so if your hand was a brain, between your wrist and your elbow is your spinal column and also your vagus nerve, which sends your emotions to the rest of your body. It does this rhythmically. So one of the best ways to calm that vagus nerve is with rhythm. And remember, Bruce Perry tells us this too, right? The rhythmic somatosensory stuff, which is why when we hold a baby to help them co-regulate, we rock. I gotta stand up so you can see it. It's beautiful. We rock them. We might bounce them a little bit, or we look them in the eye and we sing to them while rocking them. Doesn't stop with babies though. When I wanna help my six-year-old calm his little unregulated body, I hold him close and I just say, and we sway. And we sway until he stops crying and he asks for another hug. And then we're able to move on and talk about what's really, you know, at the core, what's, what's the core issue is. So think about this too. The last time that you danced with someone, and I think I've got this on a, I got all excited about talking to you guys, but I've got this on a, uh, some visuals here. Okay, 
So we're at felt safety attachment regulation. So look at this co-regulation stuff. Here's the, um, here's the mom looking at her baby and rocking. Um, but up at the top here, dancing, right? So think about the last time that you, and here's one at the bottom to a dance party. Think about the last time you danced with someone, <laughs> even if it was upbeat and it doesn't have to be a slow dance or a lullaby, but how did your body feel? Right, I've, I've listened to so many books and podcasts where Brene talks about dance parties too, right? Dance parties, so I've, I've started implementing them at our house, dance parties, they always make us laugh together. Kids tell me how silly I look, it doesn't matter. We all are co-regulating through that, that synchronous movement. We're co-regulating into a happy place together, right? So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Yeah, all right. We'll come back to that. So now we're at this vagus nerve, right? It connects to the very back of our brain, our brain stem. The next part of our brain that rests on the stem is this limbic system. And here's the next key. The limbic system is in charge of felt safety, attachment, and regulation. And we know that the limbic system can be damaged by aces and cats, both discrete and both discrete events and chronic stressors. When there's too much stress, the fear center gets too big, which makes us feel unsafe and the attachment and the regulation centers start to shrink. But when we make music together, our mirror neurons start firing because we're attaching, connecting and attuning to each other. I'm sorry, we're connecting and attuning to each other rhythmically, which means that we begin to co-regulate and feel safe. We literally begin to regrow the attachment and the regulation centers while shrinking the fear center, which means our thinking brains then come online and we're able to learn and retain information because we feel safe and connected. Okay, so that's, that's Siegel's information. And, but in 2014, this guy, Stefan Kolch, now I'm gonna go back to this. He published a review of studies examining music's ability to evoke changes in core brain structure that underlies emotion, which is what we were just talking about. And his article is called Brain Correlates of Music Evoked Emotions. His study found that music elicits activity changes in the limbic and paralimbic brain structure. He also found research indicating that music is processed in the amygdala which is a part of the limbic system, right? It releases dopamine, the reward, and it assists in building social relationships through the hippocampal formation. So what does all that mean? It means, big suspense while I stop share, there we go. It means that we can use this as practitioners to jumpstart people out of loneliness and into connection. <laughs> we can use all this information. We have the research to jumpstart people out of loneliness and into connection, to move from that below ground zero and up into some connection. So there's another book, Music as Creative Practice, and a uh, ethnomusicologist, sociologist called Nicholas Cook, he wrote it, and he talks about a guy, Alfred Schutz. He published an article, so Alfred, published an article in 1964. So, the point of all those names and dates is <laughs> 56 years ago, 56 years ago, Schutz published this article called Making Music Together. He knew then that the shared experience of the performer and the listener, so not necessarily making music together now at the same time, but a, a listener and a performer, he called it a mutual tuning in relationship. He wrote of performers and listeners being tuned into one another. And he said, it's as though they are living together and growing old together while the performance of the music lasts. So I, I thought this was beautiful figurative language. Um, and in this, in this piece that was written that long ago, Schutz describes a wonderful utopia, right? But he didn't know why it was working. He just saw it happening. He didn't have the science behind it yet. Um, the technology didn't exist. 
So it wasn't until the discovery of mirror neurons and then you know, being able to take the MRIs that we could begin to try proving why his utopia was right, why it works. But this is it. In a nutshell, the human mirror neuron system we know is a group of specialized neurons that mirrors the action and behavior of others. And it's fueled by purposeful or goal-oriented action. It's the way that we're able to get into each other's minds and hearts and understand a little more of why a person's feeling the way that they are. Because mirror neurons help us anticipate the actions of others. It's through the anticipation of what might happen next that we begin to develop empathy and to understand others as ourselves. These mirror neurons can be activated when we see, hear, or do something with another person. And remember that music incorporates all three of those things, seeing, hearing, and doing something with another person. And even, and the mirror neurons tell us that even if we're not seeing, hearing, and doing it at the same time, if we're, so if we are a listener watching a performer do it, we're connecting in the same way, right? So, um, an example of how to make it tangible for me, non-musical, is um, the YouTube of Siegel with the uh, drinking glass, right? And he has the, there's a, a video where he has a drinking glass and he says, if I just wave this drinking glass around, you're not connecting to me in any way. I'm, I'm just waving a drinking glass around because there's no purposeful action there. But if I drink water from that glass, then your mirror neurons start activating and you anticipate my next move, right? You know, I'm gonna raise that glass to my lips and I'm going to take a drink. You might even start to get thirsty and look for your glass nearby. So we've got that empathy that's starting from the, uh, from the mirror neurons, right? Okay, so now if we go back to Schutz, who saw 56 years ago music and a shared experience where listeners are tuning into one another, um, that shows us he gives us, the music provides us with a framework for the next move anticipation. That rhythmic and harmonic grounding of the piece itself, whether or not it's familiar to the listener, allows for the shared experience between the mirror neurons. Okay, so I think that's, after digging in a little deeper on this beautiful piece that he wrote, um, I think that's what Schutz meant when he said, grow old together. It's that feeling that we have when we've been with someone so long, that feeling of deep empathy, deep understanding that you have for someone that you have known, that you've lived with and spent life with for years. And it happens for the duration of that musical piece. Um, a piece that makes me think about this, um, and there might be some delay, but I'm gonna try to play it anyway, just a little bit of it as a piece by Dylan uh you may know it um by adele covered it it's called make you feel my love just gonna do a couple of verses but um i want you to to me it's kind of a universal piece as far as the feelings that it emotes hopefully all of you have heard some version of it whether it's dylan or adele i think i saw there's a there's quite a few country covers um there's, there's plenty of covers. Um, and the other thing I'd like you to think about is as you, as you have grown, um, if this is a piece that you like, um, maybe, it, well, I'll say for me, in my 20s, this piece meant something different than it does now in my 40s. Um, because now I kind of call to mind my kids when I'm thinking about this song, um, whereas before it may have been like a yearning for a partner or something. So, so though the, there's, that, there's that deep sense of yearning for me, um, but I just, uh, I think I've got to stop explaining. I'm gonna play a little bit and give you that feeling of growing all together um, through anticipating.
that's just kind of an example of what I think shoots and um, what he is meaning when he talks about growing all together through empathetic attunement and the use of music to do that and connect through those mirrored neurons. So if we go to the second piece of um, the second uh, set, we move from felt safety and attachment to the shared effective motion experience. And, uh, all right. Okay. So there's a couple of studies out there by Katie Overy and Istvan Molnar Sakic. Um, their first publication was in 2006, and they, they published this article proposing that music is perceived not only as an auditory signal, but as an intentional, hierarchically organized sequence of expressive motor acts behind the signal, and that the human mirror neuron system allows for co-representation and sharing of a musical experience. Okay, so meaning that music is not only heard, but that it's shared between players and listeners through the human mirror neuron system, which is why I spent a little time on that. All right. So we have to assume, according to the shared effective motion experience, we have to assume that three things are true. One, musical sounds are created by movement. So think singing, clapping, hitting, blowing, um, et cetera movement, plucking. Two, that this movement is purposeful and goal directed. So that's the piece that we, where we use the human mirror neuron system to encourage other bodies to begin moving too. Okay. And three, music making usually occurs in groups, which encourages synchronization of physical activity with um, temporal accuracy and flexibility. So temp and temporal accuracy I know that's kind of a big term, but I really like to use it because that means that it's happening in time, but that time with the musicians can speed up and slow down according to the group needs. That's why it's so much easier to do this stuff in person. Um, so this synchronization then encourages, think, of, think about a, uh, in, in this case, I used to love playing chamber music. So think about a, a string quartet, something like that where there's no conductor, they're not relying on a conductor, they're relying on each other to keep that music going. And the music does, the, the tempo, the speed of the music ebbs and flows. It's not completely static. Um, so the synchronization encourages eye contact, smiling, laughter, relationship building, while simultaneously allowing for leadership and individual expression. It's, it's amazing when you really think about what's happening in a, uh, like a string quartet. So assuming those three statements are true, then we can make some conclusions and understandings. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, so the human mirror neuron system has been associated with a wide variety of higher level functions according to uh, action representation. So imitation and imitation learning, intention understanding, empathy, theory of mind. So this is fun to me, this is a fun part. So what this means is we can use music and engage the human mirror neuron system to do things like teach cognitive processes. So as a music therapist, sometimes we, we might use a song, an egg shaking song to shake high, low, teach concepts, um, uh, right, left, things like that. Um, but we're engaging, we're, we're using uh, sight, sound, and action to engage all of the senses, which is why it works, because we're activating all parts of the brain, right? So, however, knocks my water bottle down. Um, so, but here's the thing. Uh, so there's that, but also the same theory holds that at a basic unconscious and automatic level, um, I'm gonna get, promise Martha, I'm gonna do a couple of things where you don't have to have a ton of musical experience and you could just play some things. I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. Um, uh, it's 2.30, I'll make sure that I, make, I, I don't go over and that we get to that next, okay? Um, so the, the same theory also holds that at a basic unconscious and automatic level, understanding the actions, intentions, and emotions of another person doesn't require that we think about them. Okay, and Cole's talked about this too, actually, in all of his research, that because music 
provides a direct line from the mirror neuron straight back to the amygdala. We don't have to think about the emotions to be able to process them. So this is one of those times. Listen to this. Um, if I play, uh, whoops, I'm gonna play it up here, it's easier. Right? You have an emotion there, okay? Same song. I didn't have to say a word and I communicated a different emotion. Um, during our lunch hour, Mary was talking about uh, using the senses to describe things. And she was using lots of colors and images and pictures. And I was thinking to myself, yeah, and there's ways to use music to do that too, right? And sound, um, there's definitely ways because it goes straight from those mirror neurons to the amygdala. So we don't have to have the words, which allows so many of the individuals who have lost capacity that we work with, uh, including me often <laughs> these days, <laughs> who have lost capacity for words to describe how they're feeling. Now we can use these other things, these other senses to allow them to communicate, you know, to allow me to communicate to you. Um, so there's that. Um, I, this stuff is really exciting to me, obviously. Um, so this means that we can use music to give us a direct line to connection, connection with others. So we don't have to rely on words to circumvent the depression, the anxiety, all of those things that are creating the loneliness. We can move past that when we're starting below ground zero, remember, and move into connection to decrease those feelings of loneliness. All right, so we can design these music experiences to bring people together, fast tracking relationships, and it can be fun and it can be playful. And like I said, because we have a straight path from the mirror neurons to the core of our brain, our autonomic nervous system, our amygdala. The amazing thing is music, this music stuff, we can plan it cognitively. So ahead of time, we can plan these things out as practitioners. But then when we're experiencing it with the individuals that we work with, we can experience it at a gut level and allow them to experience it at a gut level and really get down to some of the work that we want to be doing. Helping them feel safe and attached and co-regulated in all of those things that we need to be able to move forward or just maintain. So um, now I want to go to, hello? So now I want to go to a couple of those um, practical experiences. Let me make let me go back to my um, screen and make sure I'm at the spot. So we did that. Yes, we've got the human mirror neuron system that we talked about and the shared effective motion experience, which parallel each other and are used in conjunction with each other. All of these things together mean that we can use music to give us a direct line to being in connection with others. We can plan music experiences cognitively that we, that I used experience twice there. We use music activities cognitively that we experience at a gut level. All right. And so now we can dig into Mary's five protective factors, safe, stable, nurturing relationships, agency, external supports, affiliation, and self-esteem. All right, this is what I really wanted to get to with you and then have a little time to be able to um, talk about it and I'll go on a limb and uh, I'll ask for questions. I'm not gonna promise I have answers. All right, the, the first one that I'd like to do is the movement card idea bank. I, I have to stop share, go to the other one. Zoom. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Okay. So 
I'm just, I don't want to mess with the format and we're, I, I don't want to mess too much with time. So just bear with me there. You can see my whole screen. Um, I, uh, this was a beautiful uh, activity that I learned uh, one Saturday at a professional development for an ORF training. ORF is those, ORF is the method that uses those, uh, the little xylophones for kids. But there are so many beautiful applications of the uh, of the things that they do. Um, I believe in that that work with co-regulation so wonderfully that I attend their professional developments whenever I can. So this woman started. Her name is Kate Bright, and she started with this amazing poem that another teacher wrote, which is called a reverse verse. Um, and I guess uh, you could email me and I'd be happy to uh, somehow share this with you if you would like, or you can make something of your own after you see this, it's not, it's not too tricky. This reverse verse is beautiful. We will be okay, won't we? Because I know the seasons. All I can say is through spring and winter persist the trees with or without leaves. With or without leaves, the trees persist through spring and winter. All I can say is because I know the seasons, won't we be okay? We will. So keep that in mind as we move now through this movement card idea bank. The first thing that you would do this is kind of an instruction on how you could do this. I want all of you to hold an invisible kickball in front of you. Now, give your kickball to someone else on the screen according to the movement words that I'm going to put up in a second, one at a time. So, for example, we're going to pretend the ball is very heavy. So, I'm going to hand you into my screen a very heavy ball, very heavy ball. We're working on co regulation. That's one of the things we're working on here, okay? Now, throw it suddenly, right? Suddenly throw your ball, right? So I'm gonna go to another, um, another slide and there's some uh, movement words. We're gonna practice all the words, I'll say them out loud. You can, if you'd like to, we haven't taken a break like most of the other uh, uh, um, speakers did this morning. So you might wanna get up um, and stand up. I'm going to play a chord progression on the piano. Now, this is where if you wanted to just look up a, uh, a piece of music, like uh, think maybe like a new age piece of music or something, you could play it through your screen as you do this with a client. So you wouldn't need to, or, or with a student or whatever. Um, this to me requires more of the ability to co-regulate through the screen than it does um, musical prowess. You're using the music um, to reach a person in a new way, right? Okay, so I'm gonna go to the next screen. Okay, so hold that ball and I can't see you because I'm sharing my screen. So I'm just gonna trust that you're all doing it and you're amazing at it. All right, so lightly hold the ball and pass it through the screen to somebody else, lightly. Okay, now, the ball is heavy. Suddenly. Pass the ball suddenly. Now sustain. Do it directly. Hand them directly the ball and indirectly. Now we've practiced all the moves. I'm going to show you some trees. We're gonna go back to that poem at the beginning, the reverse verse, um, because the trees change. Let's go back for a second. Because I know the seasons, all I can say is through spring and winter persist the trees with or without leaves. And we're gonna go and we're gonna see some pictures of leaves. Here's all of the movements that we just practiced and a picture of a tree. I'm just gonna play some music and I want you, you can keep passing a ball or you can use that ball pass 
as inspiration for moving in another way. Move the way you see that tree. If you feel so inclined and bold enough, make eye contact with someone through the screen. That might be really hard and that's okay. Maybe you wanna look at someone's limbs and use them for inspiration. Okay, here's another tree. How does that one look? It's very different. Another tree, another season. you can see how that might be a way. And I was thinking of this during, um, during lunch with the idea of someone showing up to a session, but still feeling that isolation and that loneliness and not having words to describe it. And would there be a way to start by just playing some music and showing some pictures? And even if you're the only one moving, are you helping co-regulate through the mirror neuron system to the point where maybe by the last picture on the second session, the person on the other side of the screen who feels isolated, first of all, they show up because they wanna see what the pictures are the next time. Second of all, maybe they start moving a little bit. And once they start moving, can you then bring them online so that they're able to have some words through their prefrontal cortex? You know, I mean, what are some of the possibilities here um, for using and incorporating music in your sessions like that? Um, and we know, I mean, the, the amount of research that I showed you today is like the tip of the iceberg for why it works, how it works. I just don't wanna to get too boring for you, um, but I really nerded out with all of it. Um, okay, so I wanna do maybe one, uh, yeah, I'm gonna show you one more. And then I've got, I, I'll, I'll talk you through a couple of, I'll, I'll tell you one more, but I've got, I think this one's kind of fun. Okay. But I'm going to have to, I think I have to find it. There we go, okay. Okay. So this one too, I did not find, I did not come up with this. Um, I, I wonder, ugh, I don't wanna waste time. Just, it's not fancy. It's uh, a view screen, whatever. Um, so roller coasters, um, and this was a, a vocal exercise. So looking at the roller coasters, how do they sound? Um, and it's just something to get playful with. So with this one, I start on the back one and I go, ooh, 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 like that. <laughs> I don't know, it's just fun vocal improv. The next one, um, it goes, ooh, ooh, so <laughs> now we're just making some sounds and we're laughing and we're being silly. Um, and there's, there's other roller coasters. So what you could do, um, I have like three or four different roller coasters here. Oh, that's the, I, I won't, uh, well, all of you try it, stay on mute, but try it with me. Okay. So we go, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> so, uh, the idea might be 
that you you could play a song. This teacher played a song about a roller coaster first, um, so you could get people online co-regulating through a regular rhythmic um, uh, recording of a song about a roller coaster that you might be able to find just Google roller coaster songs, something like that. And if you find one that you like, great. If you don't, apply a different song that sort of makes some sense. And then do some vocalizations with pictures like that, or you know maybe there's trains, or just think about some pictures that you could uh, vocally uh, just kind of improv around like that. It doesn't, and, and just practice a little bit on your own, get silly, maybe do it if you, with, with some people in your house, whoever's in your house, um, try a few different things. Um, maybe have a beer first if that's what helps you. Um, <laughs> cup of coffee, whatever. Um, but yeah, try a few different things and start uh, getting creative and co-regulating um, in that way. And then start using, um, start thinking about different ways to uh, communicate and, and using the music, which we know um, moves past that need for uh, language and words. And we can start communicating in different ways. Um, I, you know what, I have a little bit of time. So, uh, so there's a, uh, uh, I'll just tell you, if you would like to look at something that's like a, uh, a call and response drumming type of thing. So drumming, I was thinking you could probably do on a, on a table with uh, pencils, things like that. You don't necessarily need an instrument or you could build an instrument um, to gather uh, or, you know, once we're back in person, all this is much, much easier. Um, so there's call, it's what's called call and response drumming, where there's a, a, uh, a call to action and then a response. Um, yeah, it, yep, <laughs> it is. <laughs> Thanks for engaging so much, Martha. Um, so uh, uh, it, if you look up Christine Stevens, she's an amazing, she teaches a lot of how to drum. She's a drum circle facilitator. If you look up call and response drumming with Christine Stevens, you'll see some good things. I was just going to show a video example of some of her work as well. Um, so I that that sort of that brings me to the um, to the end, and I wanted to save a little bit of time in case you have some questions about how you might be able to use this because that's really the most important part to me. As long as we walk away, kind of knowing that. Um, I guess I say as long as it's it's not a hard and fast rule, but I have spent the past 20 years trying to help people in this city understand that music is yes, fun. However, there is a science behind why it works, um, why we can use it when words don't work, why we can use it to help people find ways to communicate, why we can use it to help create a feeling of safety, of co-regulation and attachment, and, um, and why I know that it's one of the things that's going to save us. All right, so questions? Are there things that came through that I didn't see? There were two things in the chat. One was talking about working in a jail and how could they possibly use this technique without instruments? And another yeah. person with uh, kind of limited musical ability. I think you've illustrated that with the pictures and the sounds. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I thought the one about the jail was a, a post of particular interest. If the person who put that in the chat wants to clarify, please do. I will say that jail is tricky because you cannot use things like guitars and picks and uh, and all of that clearly. Um, so you're probably going to um, you're going to be limited at least at first until people see the benefits and then you'll have to have discussions, but you'll be limited to the voice for sure. Yeah, but there's the I mean the research starts with the voice being the connector so. Michelle Owens has a comment. Michelle, do you wanna? Yeah, um, Betsy, thank you so much for um, taking the time to explain this to us. I had such an interesting session 
yesterday, I'm a peer support specialist. I'm not a therapist. And um, I do think that I go a lot on instinct. And this client has an extensive um, trauma history. I don't profess to know anything about how to help somebody who's been through trauma. But based on some of the things that she said, she was trying not to cry. She was trying not to cry. And it's very, um, it was very clear to me in the last couple of weeks that she uses um, her health, her physical health ailments to hide behind them to try and deflect from the goals that we're trying to work on. So I announced at the beginning of the session that we could talk about her health problems for 10 minutes. But the rest of the session, we needed to work on something. We need to work on her goals. And she agreed. And then within the next like five or 10 minutes, I could tell she was fighting back tears. We were on Zoom. And somehow in the conversation, she um, mentioned that Kenny Rogers was her favorite country singer. And I used the internet to um, say some of the names of his songs and she picked one. And I read the song to her, like half of the song as a poem, but I was able to connect it to um, her being in relationship with herself in a healthy way, as opposed to denying her feelings, pushing herself away, et cetera, et cetera. And she cried. She started reciting the words of the song in between her tears. And at the end of the session, she said, you are really good, Michelle. <laughs> And I know I don't profess to, to have known what happened, but I but your your explanation today helped bring some light, help shed some light onto what happened. I've been doing this work for five years, and it was something about yesterday's session that really moved me. And so your presentation today helped really, really helped. So thank you very much. Thank you for that. That's that's amazing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Somebody else asked Betsy if there were any playlists that you would recommend to work with people mm -hmm. if you can't perform music with people. It's so hard to recommend playlists because they are very um, uh, tailored to the person. Um, because for example, uh, the song that I played today, for some of you that may have been, a, some of you may not know the song at all. So now you may associate it with this training, which may be good or bad. Some of you may have had a, uh, uh, a terrible breakup experience with it and it triggers you in a way, right? Some of you may have sung it as a lullaby to your child. Like there's so many, it, the experiences that accompany the songs are, are it's contingent. Like the playlists are contingent on those things. Also you have to, then you get into the idea of um, if you, once you move past that, if you want to, and you're musically trained, then you get into like beats per minute and how does that affect your, you know, your heartbeat and the, and the regulation and the, and then we start talking about, you know, the whole mindfulness idea, things like that. So it's really, um, you need to talk to the people that you're working with and develop those playlists with them is, is really the best way to do it. You mentioned new age music, uh, Betsy, as a possibility. Is there something about the cadence of that or was that just a recommendation? No, it was just something calm and relatively peaceful that I was thinking. Um, yeah, with, with, my, um, with my son, um, when we're doing homeschool and I find him to be dysregulated, I play Baroque music. It's got a very predictable pattern. So that works for him. It just I, when my children were misbehaving, I would threaten them with Yanni and Enya, and they immediately shaped up. Okay, they immediately so that's shaped a up. different it use. Just, it was perfect. And every once in a while, when they're here in the backyard now with their own children, I'll put Enya on in memory of trees, and it triggers this hysteria among them. 
and nobody understands why they're laughing so hard at a new age song. So when you said new age, I just had to chuckle. Right. Also, the you understand my playlists don't work for everyone. <laughs> Tailored to the person. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Okay. Somebody else has a comment, Stephanie. That is me. Oh, hi. Hi. Oh. Um, so, as kind of, I I also made this little joke in the the uh, comments box of now you've discovered the science of mosh pits. So oh. there we. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's very true. It is very true. Um, so I, um, I used to work with teenagers and I had a group that I would do where I would have them write down uh, the title of a song and I would look it up on YouTube and I said it has to be appropriate and lyric and content. Um, and what I would do is I would play those songs and I would have them write down whatever thoughts or feelings came to their minds. And that was kind of the um, kind of the uh, catalyst of what of me discovering or me wanting to know more about you know can, um, music's role in coping with emotions and for a lot of kids because I, I used to work with a lot of a lot of inner city kids and so a lot of them liked rap music and things like that which you know, earlier in the 90s when gangster rap became a thing, they were talking about what they saw on the streets and they were putting it to music. And so a lot of kids could validate or feel validated from what they heard in that music, you know, similarly for other genres as well. Um, and so I just wanted to toss in that that's kind of where, um, you know, my inspiration came from and why you know I talk about how and why music is so important and you know give some examples of artists who have gone through their own troubles and trauma and have um, put that to music in the sense of being cathartic of healing of you know wanting to reach out to other people too so yeah yeah absolutely and um, elements Downtown does an amazing job of uh, helping kids write music and record music. Um, <clears throat> and then we uh, had started last year, we were in the first year of our, uh, of a project. We, um, so Carnegie Hall, the Weil Institute is a, the research arm of that. And uh, they have this thing called the Lullaby Project and it's in a lot of the major cities and we brought it to Cincinnati. And so that's helping moms who have who uh, moms who are with child or who have young children. And we actually did it with the fatherhood project at Talbert house too. Um, dads who are, are working through their story of what it means to be a father. Um, we helped them write stories and lullabies and live into um, those things. And when you have it set to music, it's, it becomes number one, it's a way to connect with your child through the lullaby, co-regulation, all of that. Number two, it becomes a, uh, if it's the story of the parent that you want to be, it's an easily repeatable mantra, a beautiful mantra to sing every day about who you want to be and who you are. So, yep. And that can apply to teens very easily too. You can move those rap songs that speak to them and reflect what they see into how can we make this be who you want to be and who you are. Wow, thank you so much, Betsy. Uh, Melissa, would you like to uh, bring our fall conference to closure? Uh, we, on behalf of the Education Training Committee, uh, we would like to thank Melissa for her oversight and her, all of her work that she did behind the scenes. She is a fantastic executive director for our Tri-State Trauma Network. And even though this is our first dip into uh, uh, Zoom fall conferencing, um, Betsy, I wanted to thank you and all of the presenters for just sharing your willingness to, to give it a try and, get, and be out there. And we so appreciate it. 
uh, your willingness, to, a willful suspension of disbelief, if you will, as they right. say. <laughs> and I, I thought you might, uh, 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 but thanks everybody for being part of it. Melissa, if you would like to comment about the evaluations and wrap it up for us. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you, Tim, for, for being such a good help with the conference and the rest of the uh, conference committee. Thank you, Betsy. That was wonderful. I, I love hearing you sing and play and connecting with all of us around music. You did a great job with explaining the science around it as well. I'm a huge mu music lover, and I made a commitment to myself to do more musical stuff with my family, <laughs> thanks to you. Um, I miss going to concerts like that's that was a huge thing for my husband and I so we have to uh, recreate some more of those experiences at home, not with us singing and playing music but with listening. <laughs> so thank you so much for being with us. Um, thanks to everyone who participated in one or both days of the conference we appreciate you supporting uh, Tri-State Trauma Network. We appreciate you coming to learn more about different pieces of trauma-informed and trauma-responsive care. Uh, thanks to our sponsors. And uh, the evaluation did go into the chat box, so you'll find it there. You should be able to click right on it and get to the evaluation. Um, we have been taking attendance, and once we match that up with the evaluation being complete, we will get all that information together and send out certificates. Uh, we'll also have recordings available from today's sessions. This time I remembered to record them once, one at a time. So you don't have to listen to six hours at once. Um, so I'm grateful for everybody, you know, being here. One thing I noticed about today, I am not being pulled into five different rooms. I actually got to hear full sessions this year, which was, you know, like an unexpected benefit to having this over Zoom. So um, it's been another great day. Everybody, you know, take good care of yourselves. Enjoy this, the rest of this beautiful day. And we hope to see you at another Tri-State Trauma Network event in the future. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. You know, we had 98 people stay to the very end. Yeah. That's fantastic. And a little over 100 yeah, signed in for afternoon. Yeah. And it's, you know, these are long days. So that's really good. And uh, yes. uh, I, I was real pleased with the responses to people and uh, looking at the different screens. So that was cool. Yes. The evaluation is here to make sure that people stayed. Um, but if you somehow missed it, uh, feel free to email me and we'll, we'll double check your, that you uh, participated. And thanks for the, the appreciation, Jill. All oh, very nice comments. Very yeah. Helpful. Very, very supportive. Okay, that's cool. Do you make a, uh, are you, you're making a, a, a copy of the chat room to verify attendance in case the agency? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. uh, I, yeah, I copied uh, it earlier and I'll copy it here. Okay, at the yeah, screen. copy, yeah, because I, yeah. uh, I know quite a few people were coming in after lunch putting their stuff in. Oh, yeah. Okay, so. Uh, we have a couple ways to check. Okay, um, great. Yes. I just wanted to remind you because uh, I know that that some of the agencies require us to do that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, the CEU got right. us to make sure that people All were right. here and stayed. <laughs> okay, are you good? Yeah, I think we're good to sign off. I um, do too. <laughs> and uh, go enjoy a little more sunshine. Okay, turn Thank off your you. recording, huh? <laughs> oh yeah, I should turn off the recording. I just keep talking. <laughs> That's all right. All right, you take care and thanks.